Welcome back to uh, BIEB 152, Evolution of Infectious Disease. Uh, this is lecture number 13. Uh, today's lecture is on using evolutionary biology and genome sequences to track a pathogen as it spreads to the hospital. The pathogen is multi-drug resistant, and so you want to be able to stop its spread. Um, these cause a lot of problems in hospitals and a, and a, lot, of, um, a lot of mortality, actually. As always, we'll start with uh, checking the temperature of COVID-19. Um, and I guess what I want to say is that every state seems to be on the trajectory of opening back up. Uh, we've looked at lots of dynamics of this disease, uh, specifically in the United States, and we see that um, certainly we've bent the curve. The curve is even maybe dropping down a little bit because uh, mostly because New York uh, has, has really uh, stopped spreading it as fast as it was being spread around New York. But uh, there are lots of areas where it's still increasing. And um, these are a series of different epidemiological models. Next lecture, we're gonna go over one type of epidemiological model. They are all predicting that the number of deaths in the United States will continue to increase uh, due to COVID-19. And um, so why I'm showing this is that, you know, we're all going to be in circumstances in the near future where our states are opening back up, people are um, traveling outside the house more and more, and there's going to be, um, you know, a lure uh, to all of the students in this class uh, to begin to relax their social distancing and so forth. And looking at these models, uh, it's not that safe to, to be out there. I mean, the probability that you'll get the disease and you'll, you'll have serious consequences are relatively low, but you don't want to take those risks. However, I also understand that we have to consider mental health and other factors, and you might want to get out and see people. Um, maybe you saw grandparents over uh, Mother's Day, and, and you'll want to do the same kind of thing over Father's Day or, or something like that. And so as, as you are making these decisions about what kind of risks you want to take, certainly the decisions you make um, should be based on data, and based on science. Um, and so what I want to share with you is actually an, uh, an assessment tool in which you can use uh, in order to understand uh, how, much, how much risk are you taking. Uh, if you go to a place with 10 other people, um, what's the pro probability that uh, one of those 10 people actually has COVID-19 and could spread the disease to you? Uh, of course, like we talk about in this class all the time, this is just a probability. It's not a definite. Um, and so sometimes a small group will actually have somebody that has COVID-19 and sometimes a large group won't have somebody that has COVID-19. Uh, but this helps you uh, figure out uh, exactly what your, what your risk is. So I'm going to actually stop sharing the screen for now. Uh, and I want to go actually to the website to show you guys how this works. Hopefully you guys can see this screen. Um, what I'm showing you here is this assessment tool. Uh, this is by uh, a collaborator from Georgia Tech, Josh Weitz. And um, what's really cool about it is it's all the time getting updated with new data on the prevalence of COVID-19 in different states. Uh, and so right now what I have is put into here is California. And so you can put all of the different states that you might want information on. Um, and then you can even put in an event size. Um, and so this event size is uh, the size that if we were to meet uh, as a class, how many people would, would, have, to, would have to be in one uh, lecture hall? And that's 356 people. Uh, and so it gives you a number of different probabilities um, that are increasingly high. Um, and so this 18.2% is based on the raw numbers of the prevalence of COVID-19 uh, in California right now. And so that just means that there's there is a about 18.2% chance that one of us in that room actually has COVID-19 and can spread it to the rest of us. Then there's two other numbers of increasing frequency 
Um, and what this is, is that we know that COVID, we, we know that COVID-19 is being undercounted, right? So not everybody that has it is showing symptoms and so they're not being tested. You know, testing is not as widely available as we would like yet. And so we know that we're probably underestimating the prevalence of COVID-19 by five times and 10 times. Um, this is based on looking at the example of New York where they're beginning to uh, do a lot more testing and, and revealing a lot more cases than they thought they originally had. Um, and it's also based on a couple other calculations, but there are lots of areas in the country where we're probably under, underestimating COVID-19 by 10. Um, and so this just gives you the, the probability that somebody in that room has it, if you consider underestimate of five times or 10 times. And so uh, this is a really handy tool. Uh, certainly, you know, given these numbers, I would not wanna have my class right now. Uh, we're all safe uh, that we're at home um, over Zoom. Uh, I kind of hate giving lectures over Zoom, um, but you know, that's, that's the situation we're in right now. So uh, we can keep using this tool throughout the summer and the fall and see what our, what our risks are. Of course, this just tells us the probability that somebody in our vicinity has it, not the potential that then they'll spread it to us. Um, certainly if they have a mask on, if we have masks on and our social distancing, then um, that's, that the spread is even less likely. Okay. So um, that is a cool tool. Uh, I sent it around to my friends and family, uh, and I hope it helps you guys uh, just assess what kind of risk um, you, you wanna, you wanna uh, take um, and sort of weigh the costs and benefits and, and to think about the actual numbers um, and potential uh, of, of spreading this disease. Okay, and uh, to the main lecture. This is BIEB 152, Evolution of Infectious Diseases. Lecture number 13, tracking pathogen spread within hospitals using principles of evolutionary biology. Okay, so just like last time, I'm gonna focus in on one study mostly um, that is just a great example and um, of how you can track pathogens through hospitals um, and uh, was one of the first examples of applying genomic technology and evolutionary principles to being able to track pathogens through hospitals. Uh, the pathogen that this researcher here, uh, Evan Snitkin, who was at the time uh, a postdoc at the US National Institute of Health Clinical Center, um, but now is a professor at the University of Michigan. This paper came out in 2012, so the study was, was obviously done before then, um, I think in the, the late aughts. And the microbe that they're tracking through hospitals is Klebsiella pneumoniae. And uh, the particular strain that they're interested in tracking is one that has uh, carbapenem resistance. And so carbapenem is a new antibiotic that is kind of our last ditch effort. And um, so if people have strains of bacteria that have multi-drug resistance, this is the last, the last uh, antibiotic that tends to be used um, and is usually suppressive. Um, however, there is carbon penin resistant strains. Uh, and so you wanna be able to track them in hospitals and stop their path um, of spread in hospitals. And so that's what the focus of, of this research was on. So in this study, similar to Tammy Lieberman's, uh, we have 18 patients, so a small number. This is just a mini epidemic of in a, in, in a, in a single hospital. Uh, 11 of these people died, six directly from the infection. So this is very serious. These are pathogens that we used to be able to treat. We used to be able to kill Klebsiella pneumoniae very easily, but now it's multi-drug resistance and even has a gene for carbon epidemic resistance. So just a little bit of a few facts on the, this antibiotic. Um, and uh, this bacteria. So it's responsible for 15% of gram-negative infections in intensive care units. So it's, it's prevalent in ICUs and it causes a lot of infections. Uh, it primarily infects immunocompromised patients. So it's beating up on people that um, you know, have, have uh, compromised immune systems for various reasons. Uh, pneumonia 
uh, spreads by silent carriers that appear uninfected. So this is kind of like COVID-19 where people could have the pathogen, not show any symptoms, spread it to somebody who's vulnerable, and then they get a really bad infection. Uh, carbonephrin resistant strains are difficult to treat. And if you have one of these resistant strains, the probability that that pathogen is gonna cause mortality is 50%. So it's extremely high. Um, this antibiotic is used uh, to treat multidrug resistance. Um, one of the reasons why it's so effective at treating um, patients that have strains that have multidrug resistance is that its mechanism of entry into the cell and its mechanism of, um, of working on the cell and causing uh, the bacterial death um, or stasis is a mechanism that is distinct from other antibiotics. And so there's not much cross resistance between other antibiotic resistance and uh, resistance to this antibiotic. Uh, and the way that resistance evolves is not by point mutations, um, as we've seen with other antibiotics, um, but actually by gaining a gene, carbapenemase, uh, so that's, a, that's an enzyme uh, that acts on the antibiotic, I guess, to uh, inundate it. Um, and so uh, that antibiotic resistance gene is passed horizontally on plasmids. Um, and so it can spread from one strain to another strain, which is obviously really bad. Um, but actually the, the transfer that we're gonna talk about today is not the transfer of the plasmid from one bacteria to another bacteria, but the transfer of that whole bacteria from one patient to another patient. Okay. So our question, our overall question is, how did this outbreak spread in the hospital? Uh, if we figure this out, uh, then we can develop strategies to limit spread. And the method that we're gonna use to uh, track the spread is whole genome sequencing to re reconstruct the order of transmission by following the temporal addition of mutations. So this is basically using phylogenetics, um, but this time, I'm going to sort of give you the data uh, from the paper, and we're gonna construct these networks, which are analogous to phylogenetic trees, but they're networks that tell us uh, in what direction did the pathogen spread um, from one patient to the next patient. Okay, so this is the first data that we get, and this is not genomics data. This is not evolutionary biology. This is classic epidemiology. This is the type of data that hospitals have been collecting for a very, very long time. Um, and so what hospitals do is they record um, what patient is where throughout the hospital, um, and at what time is that patient in a particular ward or uh, in the ICU, um, and so forth. And so let's actually start with the, the bottom graph, uh, B, and then we'll work our way up to A. Um, so what B is just this massive amount of data of where patients were at what time in the hospital. Uh, so obviously the, the data is, you can see that it's, it's incomplete because there's these sort of white gaps, um, but it's, it's pretty good. I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing that hospitals keep all of this information. Um, and so what we have on the y-axis are patient IDs. So this is not, you know, this is not a continuous axis. This is just patient number one, um, was in different locations at different times. Um, and so what, uh, what this is showing here is uh, we have these different dates on the x-axis, we have these different patients, and each of these, uh, these rectangles indicates uh, where that patient was at a given point in time. And this legend here tells us uh, exactly, you know, uh, gives us a color code for those different places in the hospital that the patient was in. And so normally what people would do is if you had a disease spreading uh, between patients within a hospital, um, you would begin to look at where they were and try to figure out pathways of transmission through the hospital. Um, and so what this is showing, so let's just sort of dive into the data a little bit more. What this is showing is that this patient number one, um, and so that's, that's actually the first patient that they discovered had this 
antibiotic resistant strain of pneumonia. Um, and uh, so they were in, they were in different portions. So they're in the ICU, they recovered, they were doing better. They were in ward, uh, I don't know, um, the coloration is not the best. Maybe we'll say ward A uh, or E. I guess I think that's ward A. So they recovered, they're in, um, in this ward. Um, then they went back to the ICU. So something you know, really bad was happening. Uh, they recovered again. Um, and then either they left the hospital or, or perished. Um, you know, let's not think about that. But uh, so then this patient must have had it and then spread it to other patients. Um, and so you can see that you know, they, might, they definitely overlapped with some of these other patients. And so they began to spread the disease. Um, and then what ended up happening is it spread to 18 or spread to 17 new people, 18 people in this cohort in total. What this, what this overall pattern is showing you is all of this yellow on the right side. What that is is that after they detect that somebody has this antibiotic resistant strain, they isolate them into a, a different area of the hospital uh, with just people that already have this strain uh, to limit the spread um, to other, other areas of the hospital. Um, and so what this black line indicates is when they first detected a strain that had that antibiotic resistance. And so that time between the black line and the yellow line is when they detected and then when they finally got the person um, sequestered. Obviously at first they didn't realize they had a problem and so they didn't have this cohort set up. Um, but at some point, I guess when they had four more patients they had with this uh, antibiotic resistance strain, they realized that this was, a, this was a huge problem, created this new ward and moved people over there. This, uh, this graph at A, before we move on, sorry about that, this is just telling you when they realized that they had um, the antibiotic resistance strain. So this line's up here, that line's up there, that line's up there. So that's just, it's just kind of redundant data. Um, this data here is, is actually in this figure as well. So normally, before we had genomic technology, before we um, used it to track diseases, um, what people would do is they would construct these um, networks of the possible pathways in which uh, the disease was being spread from one patient to the next. And so what these networks are based on is that uh, patient number one, that is the first one, you know, it's patient zero actually in that terminology, the, the first person that had, um, had the disease overlapped with patient number three, overlapped with patient number nine, and overlapped with patient number 15. And so they would have predicted that, okay, one spread it to three, nine, and 15. And then, um, then you have this crazy network of possible ways that it then got spread to all of the other patients. And you know, where we start out with arrows in certain directions, now we have double arrows because you know, one could have infected three, could have infected 17, could have infected 14, and then infected 15. And so that's why there's sort of a double arrow here is that one could have directed to 15, then directed to 14, or it could have gone in that roundabout route and spread from 14 back to 15. So you know, this network, is pretty much useless because it's way too complicated. And then most of the arrows in the network are bi-directional. And so it doesn't tell you exactly who gave you know, the disease to, to which person. Um, and so this is, this is traditional epidemiological uh, practices. Um, and so uh, epidemiology is something that we're gonna talk a lot about today and also in the next lecture. And so this field of science is the branch of medicine that deals with the uh, incidence, distribution, and possible control of diseases and other factors relating to health. Okay, well, that's sort of the official definition um, and it's kind of vague. The way that I think about it is it's the, um, it's the type of medicine that thinks about things at a population scale. So it thinks about you know, the spread of SARS-CoV-2 uh, across the globe or within a, within a region. Um, it's not thinking about how to, how to cure any individual person, but sort of the larger dynamics of disease.
And so this is an epidemiological strategy because we're thinking about the sort of network of different patients and how they're, they're spreading the disease around between them. Uh, there, you know, this is the field of uh, research that's interested in you know, think, thinking about epidemics and pandemics, these, these sort of large scale um, uh, dynamics and patterns of disease. Okay, so uh, that network is kind of a mess. Uh, it's not helpful. It doesn't help us figure out how to change our behaviors so that we don't spread disease in hospitals. And so, but we can couple that data with new genomic data and really begin to get a better insight on how these diseases are being spread. And so this is the genomic data. Um, it's a little bit counterintuitive, so let me walk you through it. Uh, I'm gonna start with B and then we're gonna go to A. This is, I guess, a backwards day. Um, and so uh, what, what we have here is this is a matrix of mutations. Um, and in this, in this matrix, this is a bacterial genome that's lined up on the x-axis. And um, we have, the bacterial genome obviously has something like probably like 5 million different nucleotides in it. Um, but there's not 5 million different squares here. So there's not a square for each nucleotide. What is being represented here are the individual positions in the genome that uh, when they were sequencing this pneumonia um, in different strains of it, they found that there are mutations in it. Um, and so this is just the, the, the information about the genome in the sites in the genome that vary among these different strains. And so this is, this is, this is really what we wanna hone in on. Basically, the rest of the genome is redundant. It's identical to, to uh, itself. And so uh, what this means is that Let's, let's say, okay, so let's, let's go over the axes again. So this is genome position. Um, and then what the y-axis is are um, different bacterial genomes isolated from different patients um, in maybe different uh, regions of, of a single patient or different areas of the hospital. And so, you know, that, these are the numbers for the different patients that we've gone over before. Um, they've also sampled uh, bacteria from a vent. They found it uh, actually not on a patient, but surviving up in up an event. That's scary. Um, and uh, then, obviously, uh, with patient number one, the first patient that had it, um, they sampled lots of different bacteria from that patient uh, in order to understand, um, you know, was it evolving in that patient? And then, um, if there are different variants within that patient, did different variants spread? Uh, to, to other patients. Uh, and so if you have a light gray square, that's an ancestral allele, that means you don't have a mutation. If you have a black square, that means you do have a mutation in that position. And so this is just a matrix of zeros and ones um, that tell you whether or not there's a mutation at these different positions. So gray is zero, one is, is black. Um, and so uh, what you can see here is this is a zoomed in view of just the variants that are happening in different strains isolated from patient number one. Okay, so we sampled lots of different strains from patient number one uh, from different regions of their body uh, in different ways of isolation. And um, what we find is that, you know, many of them have no mutations at all, but some of these isolates actually do have mutations. This means that uh, this strain was actually evolving and accumulating mutations as it was infecting that patient. This is very similar to what we saw with uh, CF patients as well uh, last time. And so um, then if we sort of look at the sort of broader picture of what's going on here, um, we can see that these different strains within this patient number one spread. And so they spread and cause this cluster number one of patients and this cluster number two of patients. So what I'm looking at here, why I'm able to say that, is that we can see that um, you know, there's, there's a lot of these bacteria that have no mutations, and then they likely spread to these other cluster of patients and got this unique set of, of mutations in its genome. Um, and then we also see that these, these strains here 
um, are in patient number one, and they have three mutations. So that's, that's this guy here. They have three mutations. And um, then there's this whole second cluster of patients that were infected that have strains that also have those three mutations. And so this one person must spread to multiple different uh, people. And we can actually reconstruct that because one group of people got an isolate that didn't have any, any mutations uh, yet, or it does look like actually this is, this is uh, from, from, um, from patient number one here and has these three mutations. And then this whole cluster down here has those three mutations plus an additional one. And then this, this patient here has, has another one as well. And so this tells us this sort of overall pattern is that, yeah, it began to mutate in patient number one, and then it spread giving rise to all of these, this cluster of patients two, three, and five. Um, and then over here, uh, this, there's a second patient cluster you can see where this is a strain that's in patient number one, that has three mutations, and then all of this whole cluster up here has the same three mutations. And so these, uh, they all evolve these additional mutations as the strain spread from one to, to them and then among them. So that starts to give us some, some insight on what's going on here. Um, and so you can sort of work your way through all of that data and you can begin to reconstruct likely pathways. And so what I'm showing here now is a, uh, the pathway that the authors of this paper um, hypothesize that this uh, strain took from one patient to the next patient. Um, and so this, this is what traditional um, uh, methods would give us, but now coupling with genomic data, we actually have a much more narrow set of connections between these patients and an actual likely pathway that gives you a direction rather than these, these arrows that have uh, arrows on both sides. Now you can actually see sort of how this is spreading. So these arrows have uh, two different colors. One is an epidemiological link. One is a non-epidemiological link. Okay, so what this means is that this link from one to three was one of them that was a possible one predicted given standard epidemiological techniques. So that's that arrow right there. Um, and so, you know, this, all of these connections here, one to three, three to five, five to two, uh, were predicted by the, the standard techniques. But what's really fascinating is that one to four, four to nine, one to eight, these are not predicted um, using standard epidemiological techniques. Um, but when we look at the genomes, we can actually see that it's most likely that, you know, just looking at the pattern of mutations and how those mutations accumulate over time, that one likely spread it to four and eight, even though they never overlapped in the same area of the hospital. So there must have been some kind of carrier that spread it to them. So an, another patient might have had it and been asymptomatic and overlapped with these two different people, or you know, maybe through the vents or something like that. There is some other mechanism or pathway connecting patient num number one to patient number four. So it means that we were not just, not only is this old way of doing things giving us this overly complicated map that is not, not very informative, uh, it is actually even missing connections between patients. So it's, it's overly complicated, but yet it's not complicated enough. It doesn't have all of the information. Um, so yeah, so let's now get into actually, you know, how do we look at these, these um, graphs or how do we look at these matrices and make these, these um, pathways of transmission? Okay, so in particular, I wanna go back to the data and I want to, with you guys, reconstruct how one went to three to five to two. Why we, why we have that, that, um, that ordering based on the genomic data. Um, so note that in the epidemiological data, you know, we knew one, we, we thought one went to three, but we didn't know sort of the pathway from three to five to two, that seems most likely, but it could have been three to two to five. And so um, now we can make sense of that order given the, the genomic data. 
Okay, so this is you know a lot of a lot of stuff on the screen here. Um, what I'm showing you is I have taken this is that larger matrix that we were just looking at, and I've taken out just a sub matrix of it, so a, a, a smaller component of it. That's what I'm showing you guys here, um, and then um, this is I'm also just showing you um, the. The, the classic epidemiological data so that we can sort of cross-reference with the genomic data. Okay, so we know that, um, that it started in patient number one, and then we wanna ask ourselves, where, who did it spread to next, right? So we have um, in this, this subplot, um, this is cluster number two, if you remember from the original matrix, um, we just have three new patients that, that got, got the disease from patient number one. So two, three, and five. Uh, these are, are, of course, are just patient number one down here. Just different strains isolated from patient number one. Okay, so we want to ask ourselves, you know, given this data, how do we, where do we think that this, this uh, strain, how do we think this strain spread? Uh, who, I guess the better question is, more precise, who is the next person that got the strain from patient number one. Uh, so of course, if you have number one, maybe it was patient number two. That's the next person on our list. Um, but actually, I would not predict that patient number one gave it directly to patient number two. And the reason is, is that patient number two has two unique mutations um, in its genome, whereas patient number three and patient number five have only one additional mutation from the original strain that came from patient number one. And so it is parsimonious that the strain spread to either three or five um, and then spread from these, these patients uh, to patient number two. So the next, the next question is, okay, we predict given the genomic data, how did it, sp it spread to either patient number three or patient number five? And can we now cross-reference with the epidemiological data in order to determine whether or not we think it spread first to three and then to five, or first to five and then to three? Um, or maybe it spread to both of them. And so how, how, do we, um, how can we reconstruct this? Well, we can now go back to this original uh, uh, data of which patients overlap with which other patients in these different areas of the hospital. And we can um, figure out, you know, who did patient number one overlap with? Did they overlap with patient number three or did they overlap with patient number five? And so what we can see quite clearly is that patient number one had two sort of separate times where they spent um, time in the ICU with patient number three um, whereas there was no overlap, um, there was very little overlap in time of patient number five with patient number one in the hospital, and they never overlapped in the exact same uh, ward or, or area of the hospital. And so that suggests that it's, it didn't transfer to patient number five and is most likely to transfer to patient number three. Then, since patient number three then we can ask our question, you know, did patient number three ever overlap with patient number five? And then creating a possible pathway to patient number five. And that's what we, we definitely see, that they spent some time in the ICU together. Okay, so it makes sense then that patient number one did not directly spread it to patient number five, but it went to three first, then to patient number five. And then the next step is from patient number five uh, to patient number two. Let's just cross-reference to see if patient number five, yep, patient number five and patient number two uh, overlapped in the ICU as well. Um, and so, you know, that network of connections now uh, is a direction. You go from one to, to three, three to five, and then five to two. And that's, that's what makes the most sense in terms of the genomics, uh, but it also makes sense in terms of the uh, overlap of these patients in different areas of the, the hospital. Okay, 
So now I want to actually do a problem with you guys. Um, we just kind of did, but you know, this is, this is what you're going to see on your exam. Um, and so I'm actually going to uh, stop sharing my screen and use the whiteboard behind me to help you answer these things. So this is, this is the network. And uh, in the question, I asked you to um, look at these patterns and create a, create a, um, a pathway. Uh, and in the question, I, had, I just pointed out a few different strains. And that was just to sort of make the set smaller so it was easier for you guys to, to work through. Um, but actually, you know, I'm working with you right now. And so let's just, let's just try to figure out the pathway for all of these different pathogens. Um, I'm sorry, all of these different strains of this pathogen. Uh, and so if you look at the, where you start with this, right? So I don't have patient number one here. Um, all I have is, uh, you know, this, this sort of subset of the matrix. Um, and uh, so the way that I want to start is I want to start with the strain that has the fewest mutations. This is the, the sort of, it's more ancestral than the rest of the strains that have mutations that are more derived. And so that strain is number seven. So you can see that, yes, it does have mutations compared to number one, but all of these sites out here are not variable, whereas these guys all have some variation at those sites. Okay, and so let's, let's sort of, what we wanna do is we wanna now um, make connections to these other, these other strains, but we wanna do it in a stepwise manner where we're just adding in new mutations. And so what is interesting is I can tell from this that there's actually a lot of different clusters. A um, lot of different unique mutations, and so there's going to be lots of connections uh, stemming out from number seven. So seven is going to go to the vent. That's this guy here. This one mutation. It's a unique mutation. So from the rest of them, so it's on its own little own little island. Um, Sixteen, and it has two unique mutations. There's no other strain that has a subset of those two mutations, so no other strain that has just one of those two. And so we, we say that um, that seven that has nine goes directly to 16 that has two. Um, and then we have 11, which has three unique mutations, and none, no other strains have a subset of those. And so we go directly from seven to 11. Um, and then, uh, now we have this cluster of strains that are all related to each other. Um, and so we have 12 and 13 um, have two new mutations. So I'm actually gonna put 12 and 13 like this um, because we don't know, they have the exact same uh, mutations. So we don't know if, um, if 12 became, came before 13 uh, or how that actually worked. And then from this group here, I'm gonna draw an arrow out to 18. So what happened from 12 to 13 is then it's it spread to 18 and it accumulated two additional mutations. And so given this sort of small subset of the data, um, this is the network that you would, that you would draw. Um, and certainly you can look at the answer um, on the slide. It's going to be a, a subset of, of this more complicated network. Um, if you're a really attentive student and you go back and you look at um, the, the actual uh, diagram that was predicted in the paper, um, it is going to be slightly different from this. This is because we've just based this on this sort of smaller matrix. We're missing information. And so when you build out the fuller matrix, you actually um, find that the pattern is slightly different. This is a lesson that the more data, the better, the more accurate you're going to get, um, the more you're going to be able to um, uh, find distinct pathways in this, in this data. Okay, so this is the answer for this smaller subset. Um, let me just look behind me. You guys can't see this, but um, yes, in fact, we have, um, we have the network that we built um, is, uh, is a larger version of, of C. Okay, so the bottom line is there is that you, get, you go from this complex web 
through something that actually makes sense and you can track things moving through hospitals. Um, so I guess I just wanted to go back to, you know, what happened between patient number one and patient number four. Um, you know, this is a case where patient number one and patient number four did not overlap, but our genomic sequences suggest that the strain went from patient number one to patient number four. And so what, what exactly happened? The, the hypothesis uh, is, and that they went over in the paper, is that actually it seems that there was, or there are possible patients that were carriers that spread it from one to a carrier and then two, four. And so in our, in our sampling, we didn't, we only sampled people that were showing signs of the infection. We didn't sample everybody in the hospital uh, for, um, for pneumonia. And so um, we were, we're missing data and we're missing sort of pathways. Um, and so uh, this is uh, epidemiological data now of people that were in the hospital that overlapped with one and four in a way where you could get a bridge from one to a carrier then to four. And so for you guys to be able to see this, so these are hypothetical carrier patients. Um, there are lots and lots of patients obviously in the hospital. This is just a subset that could offer a bridge between these two patients that had uh, very serious infections of pneumonia. Uh, and for the example that I'm showing you, this is just for uh, the hypothesis that patient A was the carrier. Um, and that would be that patient A overlapped in the ICU with one, and then also overlapped in the ICU with patient number four later in time. So went from one to A, A to four. Okay, so let's, let's do this, um, this uh, second problem. In this problem, we are going to, we have um, hypothetical epidemiological data, and we have hypothetical genomic data, uh, and we want to sort of see, uh, we want to use both pieces of information in order to uh, determine the, the likely pathway of the, the pathogen. So, okay, back to the board. You know, what we have here is um, we can see that patient number C doesn't have any of the mutations. And so patient number C is the very beginning. Patient number C, or <laughs> number C, sorry, letter C. And then, uh, then we have a case where we have um, uh, patients that have um, additional, additional mutations. Um, so, okay, let's, uh, let's look at this. So this is, this is pretty straightforward. Um, D has one additional mutation. As you can tell, I haven't, I haven't gone over this in a year, so this is kind of solving this live with you guys. Um, and, um, then you can sort of see uh, from there, there's uh, a bifurcation point where you're going to have to make multiple different arrows uh, because you have now D, you have A, which has a bunch of new mutations. A has a bunch of new mutations. Um, but, and D has some of those mutations. So A and D are actually clustered together. D has additional ones. So D is... D, we can just add this now, I'm sorry, E, I'm saying E is here. So you can see it goes from C to D, D up to A, they get these three new mutations. E has those three mutations, but it also has two additional ones. And so this is a pathway, C to D, A to D. Okay, but now we have to figure out where is B in this whole uh, scenario. So B, has the D mutations. So it's not, B is not a descendant from C, it's a descendant from D, but B has a whole nother set of mutations that are distinct from A and E. And so B goes here. And so um, as you can see, you have to just sort of be systematic and sort of walk through these and be aware that, um, uh, you know, there, there can be cases where there's not a direct line from one patient to the next, but one patient spreads it to multiple different patients. And so you have to always be aware that you might have these, what I'm calling bifurcations. Um, and in this problem here, we actually have the ordering, um, but what we can do, so we don't need to, we don't necessarily need to go back to the epidemiological data. 
But what we can do is see if this um, data makes sense with this data, and if this pathway makes sense given that data. Um, and so we can see that C and D overlapped in ward uh, number one, and then, uh, um, then D overlaps with everybody in um, uh, ward number two, and so that is what gives you the opportunity for A and B, and then A and E, A and E also overlapped in ward ward number two with each other, um, and so that's a case where uh, the epidemiological data does support um, uh, the pathway from the from the genome. Okay, so C to D to B and A and E. Yep, that's, uh, that's what we have on the board, so that's good. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> so I am uh, gonna wrap up this story, uh, but we, are, we do have a little bit more lecture, um, and, but I hope I am on time today. I'm trying to be, uh, cut things back a little bit. So uh, yeah, um, I guess one of the other bits of, bits of interesting information that, I, that are in this paper is that um, right now, in, so far in the lecture, we have just treated all of these mutations as if they're just kind of these markers that pop up in the genome that we use to trace the evolution, that we, we use to trace the pathway of the bacteria. Um, but some of these mutations, actually it turns out, uh, impact features of the cell that likely increase its, its level of antibiotic resistance. And so yes, this is a multi-drug strain, um, or multi-drug resistant strain, um, but I guess there's always room to get extra levels of resistance uh, and get very high levels of, of generic resistance. And so, of course, do not memorize this table, but these are just the examples of specific mutations that were a part of that matrix, um, but that fall in genes that we think are actually improving the bacteria's resistance to, our, to the medicine. Okay. So this is the, the full citation from that paper that we just went over. Uh, it has been cited 754 times as of this morning. Uh, so that's a lot of citations. And uh, it's because it, it did have a big impact on the field. Uh, and now people are using this more and more, this technique uh, to tra track things in hospitals. And as sequencing becomes uh, cheaper and cheaper and hospitals get their own sequencing machines, um, this approach will be uh, used more and more um, so that we can stop the spread of these, these deadly pathogens. Uh, this is a paper, and I'm gonna go through quickly, so don't, don't worry about it too much. Uh, but this is one of the papers that cites that earlier paper. This is by, um, also by Evan. Um, and uh, this is one where they're actually able to use these types of techniques to track the spread of pathogens, not just within a hospital, but actually between different facilities as well, between hospitals and nursing homes and so forth. Um, and so here is uh, phylogeny from this paper. Um, they're, they're still tracking pneumonia again, and this is a multi-drug resistant strain. Um, I'm not sure sort of what facilities these are or what region of the country they were in. Um, that's that's to, so we don't stigmatize um, places. And uh, what, this, what this phylogeny is showing us is these different lines so the different edges of the phylogeny um, are color-coded to indicate different facilities. Um, and uh, these letters are just indicating these, these larger monophyletic groups within the phylogeny. So this A group, the B group, and the C group, which are associated with spreading in different uh, facilities. Um, and then um, all of these numbers on the phylogeny indicate roughly when a strain uh, transferred from one facility to another facility. So um, what this shows us is that actually facility uh, A, so light blue, um, really there's a lot of transfer from that facility to these other facilities. And so we know that A, you know, A, there's, there's a problem here. Uh, why is it always starting at, at this node and then spreading out to these other facilities? Um, can we be more careful when people uh, transfer from facility A to other facilities uh, to sort of decontaminate them or, or whatever. Um, and so uh, facility A turns out to be a nursing home. Uh, and so we're seeing with COVID-19 that, that nursing homes are these, these, these uh, 
areas where people can spread infection pretty, pretty well. And so it's clear to us now, especially in the United States, that we need to pay more attention to our nursing homes and give them better resources so that they're not these hubs um, for spreading these really bad diseases. Uh, this is also some data from that paper. Uh, it's just showing that, um, it, it, it's showing kind of two things in, in one. Uh, so this is the number of genetic links between facilities. Um, and so that's the number of times you go from blue to green, uh, red to blue and so forth. Uh, so that's the number of time genetic links. Uh, and then this is the number of patients that were transferred between facilities. And so this is just classic epidemiological data. You know, how many times do people go from facility A to facility J? Um, and uh, it turns out that there's this really nice, very highly significant pattern that if facilities were transferring more people, um, then they're more likely to also transfer the pathogen uh, from one, one facility to the other facility. What this tells us is that, you know, it really is this sort of overall pattern, this movement of patients from one place to the other place that predicts how likely they are to transfer a disease. This makes complete sense. Um, but sometimes when we are, um, when people are reconstructing these stories, they don't focus on these larger patterns and they sort of maybe demonize a certain patient, you know, a certain patient is a, is a spreader and they're causing you know, the, the disease to go from one, one facility to the other facility. Um, but this pattern is not consistent with the idea that there's just one single patient who's a spreader. This is just this overall flow where, you know, the more times patients go from one facility to the other facility, the more opportunities there are for patients to transfer the disease. And that is what bears out in this data. Okay, so the last part of the lecture I want to talk about, okay, we've been, and this is where we're really beginning to deviate uh, from evolutionary biology. It's a little bit uncomfortable for me, but um, what I want to say is that, you know, in this course, we're learning about how we can use evolutionary biology to inform us about pathogens. Well, then what, what can we do to actually, um, what, what can we do with that information? And so uh, this is an example of where people are now thinking about architecture and thinking about how to design buildings in ways um, that limit the spread of pathogens. So we can see you know, from the genomic data um, that you know, the more people that are uh, moving between one place and another place or that there are vents where this pathogen is actually occurring um, and that it's a part of the transmission pathway, um, you know, all of that kind of information as we collect more and more of it we can then begin to, to isolate where there are problematic spots in buildings um, and begin to design buildings that limit the spread of these pathogens. And so this is the next step is to thinking, to collecting data directly on um, how pathogens spread in buildings uh, and then uh, adjusting the way that we design buildings to accommodate this. And I, you know, normally I do teach this because I do think it's a, an, an emerging field it's interesting, it's interdisciplinary between architecture and, and microbiology and epidemiology. But um, I have to say that it feels even more relevant this year as we all are trying to avoid COVID-19. Um, and I believe, you know, given the scale of the pandemic that we're going through right now and the damage that it's doing, uh, that there will be so much more interest in, in this field in the future. So if this is fascinating to you, you know, I think that there's a, a good future in this. Uh, and so this is mostly data from this uh, micro B net. I'm not sure exactly how they pronounce it, um, but it's a built environment network of microbiologists that think about these problems. Um, this is based in, at, uh, in Oregon. And the two questions that we're gonna grapple with right now are how do we limit the spread of microbes? And um, so that's, that's direct. That's very clear, you know, how do we stop the spread of pathogens down a hallway or through vents or so forth like that. And so the output there is just um, limiting the number of bacteria or viruses that are getting from one room to the next room or so forth. But there's also this other question that's pretty fascinating is how do we nurture the presence of healthful microbes and suppress pathogenic microbes? 
The idea there is that maybe one of the best ways to combat uh, the spread of pathogens is to have your environment not be completely sterile and vo devoid of any microbes, but to have a rich community of microbes that are healthful. And so it's harder for pathogens to invade if there's already microbes there, you know, living on surfaces, um, using up the resources that are available to bacteria and stopping, creating the first sort of level of protection and, and buffer from uh, invading pathogens. So we're gonna talk a little bit about this idea of you know, nurturing, what are the types of things that we can do to buildings to nurture good microbes, not bad microbes. Okay, so the first thing that's pretty obvious to think about is um, what is the configuration of your rooms? You know, we have lots of different ways to construct buildings. In Southern California, I think we have really convoluted, crazy architecture, uh, especially on our campus at UCSD. Um, there's a lot of uh, brutalism and there's a lot of very contemporary architecture. Um, and actually the way that a lot of these buildings are designed where we, where we have doorways that open not to central hallways, but we have doorways that open our rooms that have doors that open directly to the outdoors. Um, that's actually a really good way to design a building in order to not spread pathogens to that building because you have all these isolated rooms, they open up to the outside where there's lots of air circulation, and so pathogens are less likely to spread. That's good for us, and we can do that in Southern California uh, because we have such great weather, um, but that's not an option for a lot of other places. And so we can think about the way that these, um, the rooms are oriented, and we can even use um, uh, graph theory, which is a type of mathematics that um, looks at these different orientations of networks and how nodes in these networks are connected, and those are abstractions to the way that buildings are designed. Um, and so we can think about, you know, how can we limit the connectedness through this network um, so it's harder for pathogens to move from one room to another room. Uh, and so this is actually the, a very common design for buildings. This is actually how my building is designed uh, that I'm in right now, where you have a central hallway and you have rooms off of that hallway. Um, and this is the worst. Uh, all of these rooms are connected by just two doorways. So if I'm in room here, this room, and I want to get to that room, I just have to go through one doorway into the central hallway into another doorway. And so this is highly connected and perfect for pathogens to spread around. So that's not good. Uh, we're getting a little bit better here because if you're in this room and you want to go to that room, you have to go through one doorway, two doorways, three doorways, four doorways. Um, and so this is getting a little bit better, but this is this sort of shotgun um, design. This is a design that a lot of apartments are built like this in New York City. Um, this actually is a very good design. It kind of sucks because you have to go through all of these different rooms to, to, to get to another room, um, but it actually uh, will limit the spread of disease um, because there's not this sort of central hallway or the central node that um, uh, can, the disease can go to and then spread out from. So, you know, this all makes sense, but um, is there data to actually support that the number of doorways is the unit that we should be thinking about in terms of the connectedness of buildings? You know, do pathogens just get into a building and spread everywhere? Um, certainly, I've talked to people that have this impression that COVID-19, that the SARS-CoV-2 particles are everywhere out in the environment, floating in the air, and that's not true. They're, they're not everywhere. Um, they're mostly clustered around people and where people touch or where, where places where people breathe. Um, and so, uh, but, you know, once you get into a building, if there's a person in this building right now, am I breathing, that has SARS-CoV-2, am I actually breathing those in? Have they, has it already circulated throughout the entire building. Um, and so there is data to su support this idea that uh, the more doorways that separate rooms, the less, um, the less microbes migrate uh, between those rooms and spread between those rooms. And so this is very indirect data, um, but it's very convincing. Um, and so let me walk you through what they're doing here. So they have, they have each of these data points is a sample of microbes that they've taken from a room um, and they've looked at which microbes are in there. They're just using uh, DNA sequencing techniques to do this. Um, and then they can say, okay, this room has microbe A, B, and C, and D. This room has microbe D, E, and F. 
Um, and so there's some overlap between the, the microbes in those two different rooms, but they are, they are also distinct. And so that level of overlap in, um, is, is what gives us this, this variable biological similar, similarity. So that's just the similarity of microbes that when you're making a comparison between two different rooms, how similar are, are their sets of microbes? Um, and so each point is not, I shouldn't have said a room, each point is a comparison between two different rooms. And so uh, rooms that are connected uh, by how many doors between the offices, so we start out with one, uh, two, um, these tend to have very similar microbes in both of those spaces, whereas um, if you're separated by 12 doors, uh, then you, you begin to have uh, share fewer of the same microbes. And so that's the pattern that you would um, predict if, um, if doorways limit the spread of microbes and of pathogens. So we can think about the overall structure of buildings, but we can also impact um, the conditions within buildings in a way that um, limit the spread of, of pathogens, or in this case, what we're gonna talk about is shifting the microbial community from pathogenic to healthful microbes. Um, and so uh, what we have here is, let's just look at this first graph and then we'll get through the, the other ones. Um, what we have here is, um, this is proportion of bacterial sequences closely related to pathogens. Okay, so basically we know, we know, we, we know what, what bacteria are pathogenic, or we know a lot of the bacteria that are pathogenic, we can sequence their DNA, and then we can com compare that DNA to DNA from bacteria that we're sampling from a, from a, a structure, from a room, or from a building. Um, and what they're doing is they're, they're getting this, 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 you know, basically the level of microbes that could be pathogenic. Um, and then on the x-axis, we have airflow, and so what they're showing is that um, if you increase the airflow, you're actually decreasing the proportion of bacteria that are pathogenic. So you're not just sort of sweeping out all of the bacteria from a room, you're actually altering the conditions in a way that there are fewer pathogenic bacteria get compared to the good bacteria. And so you're actually shifting that community towards a more healthful community. Um, and, uh, the, these these um, data points are, are colored uh, to indicate um, what types of circulation, indoor mechanical or indoor windows, uh, is causing this, this airflow, these different airflow velocities. Um, so don't, I, I'm not too worried about that. Um, just look at the overall pattern. Um, and then uh, we have another group here. This is um, outdoor spaces. Uh, so airflow was just being quantified within buildings, not out, outside of buildings, because uh, they're qualitative very, very different. Um, but what we can do is we can, we have the same, um, the same y-axis here, but now we're looking at uh, humidity and we're also looking at temperature. And so as we increase the humidity, we are decreasing the number of pathogenic strains. And uh, if we increase the temperature, we're actually increasing the prevalence of bad bacteria. So colder, dry areas are places that um, pathogenic bacteria do not do as well, and the good bacteria do do better. And so that's what we want to consider when we're adjusting climates with inside of buildings. Uh, and, and also it indicates why outdoor spaces uh, are, are, have fewer pathogens uh, in them as well. Okay. This is just a diagram for your, don't memorize this. This is just sort of talking about the different ways that pathogens get spread into the body and then get spread from the body into the built environment. And then this is a slide that sort of walks through different ways um, that we can, different things that we can augment in order to uh, produce a more healthful microbiome in our house. Uh, so we can increase ventilation, uh, obviously, we want to control uh, exposure to farms. We've talked about that a bunch of times about how um, farm animals can have pathogens that spread to us. Um, and uh, you can actually have things in your house like plants that have good, good bacteria that help support that, um, that good 
uh, house microbiome. Um, this is something that I don't think anybody really has in their house right now. It's a sensor that detects indoor uh, microbes. Um, so this is how they collect that data for those studies, but this is something that's not in people's houses yet, but maybe in the future you can imagine having a device that, um, that informs you whether or not there are bad pathogens in your house. Um, you know, we can change the, the materials that we use to build houses um, and the conditions within houses uh, to shift the microbiome to something that's more healthful. Um, and also it turns out that uh, pets do increase your exposure to microbes. Uh, this is pretty obvious. Uh, so sorry, Wrigley, I think you're, you might be a, a, a carrier for things, but of course I'm not gonna get rid of Wrigley. Okay, uh, these are just some questions that um, are uh, things that are on the horizon, uh, types of research that would, or would drive types of research that uh, would be productive in thinking about how we can augment our houses and architecture to limit the spread of diseases. We're nearing the end here, guys. I want to just sort of reflect back on SARS-CoV-2 transmission um, and there's, there are a bunch of articles and uh, cool videos of you know, how water droplets spread in air and so forth and how this virus is likely spreading um, that you can, you can see online. Um, but sort of this is just a distillation of a lot of those articles. Um, ventilation, you want ventilation. So if you, if you go back to work and there's a way to improve ventilation, uh, definitely do that. Um, you know, you want air to be flowing through and removing these particles uh, from the environment. Uh, in my lab, uh, we're talking about the next phase and, and when we can start coming back to lab and the procedures that we'll employ. Um, I'm in a building right now that uh, doesn't have ventilation to the outdoors by a window. You can't open windows. It's very contained. Um, and so obviously we have a ventilation system, but that's that's sort of running at a certain rate and I'd like to be able to increase that. So uh, without talking to facilities and you know, re-engineering the building, there are ways that you can increase ventilation in these buildings that you think don't um, have the ability to, to augment it. So for instance, uh, and I don't know if this is a great idea, but I think it will increase the ventilation through our lab. Uh, if you open up a fume hood, that has a, an air blower on it that sucks air from the room and pushes it out into the sky. And we always wanna keep those fume hoods closed so that we don't waste energy. But I think a good use uh, in a lab situation would be for us to open those fume hoods while we're working so that we're increasing the airflow through the, through the rooms um, and reducing the possibility of transmission from one person to another person. So depending on where you work and where you're, where you're going out, there might be ways to sort of hack the building um, uh, so that you can increase the airflow. So be creative and, and think about how to increase that airflow. Uh, maintain distance between people, of course. Avoid common areas. So that's, that's obvious. Uh, I think for the lab, uh, when we start to come back, we should put a sign on the door of bathrooms so that only one person's in the bathroom at a time, even though there's multiple um, toilets. Um, so that would limit the, the spread as well. Uh, and avoid elevators if you can. Uh, if you're on an elevator, just uh, be one person on that elevator at a time. Uh, so yeah, so you know, when you do go back to work, uh, when you go out in public, just think about it for a little bit before you do so and think about ways that you can avoid interacting directly with people um, or interacting with surfaces in spaces where other people are um, spending a lot of time. Okay, so don't leave yet. This is our summary. It's a very simple one for today. Uh, we can use whole genome sequencing coupled with epidemiology, epidemiological data um, to create these, tran these transmission maps. Um, and we can augment our architecture in ways um, to limit the transmission of pathogens. And so I don't want you to leave yet. Uh, because I, I want to again go circle back to COVID-19. That's what we're all thinking about. And I want to say that the things that I taught you today are the, the, the same um, techniques and the same principles that we're applying to track COVID-19 around the world. Um, and so these are, this is all uh, screenshots from NextStrain.org that we've talked about. 
where we have this phylogeny. And what I'm, what I'm showing you is that they actually have this function on the website um, where you uh, can watch how, how the, the uh, virus SARS-CoV-2 um, was evolving and accumulating mutations and diverging and splitting, and then also how it's spreading around the world. And so this phylogeny gives us information about where in the world um, this virus was at different time points and how it spread around the world. And so it starts out in China, uh, it spreads um, to other areas in the Pacific region, um, and then as, as sort of we're moving on, it begins to spread to Europe, it spreads to the United States as well, um, and then, or I'm sorry, it goes from here to here, and then here, and then now we have this sort of craziness of spread where now uh, it, it appears that you know, strains are spreading, spreading now from back, started out in China, spread to Europe and spread to North America, and now are spreading back to Asia from these places. And so now it's a, it's a mess, um, but that phylogeny and, um, allows us to be able to reconstruct all of this. So thank you guys, and I will see you uh, all next week. Take care and have a good weekend.